Good morning. Hi, good morning. And out of respect to all of you who are here already, um, we'll get going uh, on time. Um, I'm incredibly excited about today. Uh, I'm privileged to be part of a group talking to you about rectal cancer. And as you will see, as you see the faculty come through uh, talking over the morning, um, there's an incredibly experienced, talented, international leadership group of people who've steered a lot of the things that I'm going to briefly talk about uh, in the first talk. This is paired uh, with the lab. For some of you will be signed into the lab with Dr. Teresa Debesh adams uh, and some of us who are on faculty there this afternoon. And so you'll see a lot of technique talks during today, which hopefully will be very valuable. I'm co-chairing this with Dr. Giovanni Dapri uh, from St. Pierre University in Belgium, um, who's uh, a colleague and friend and um, will be introducing the next speaker. Uh, I think it's exciting that we have such a big room, obviously less than exciting when it's this early in the morning and not too many people in it yet, um, but I'm sure it will fill up in time because this is just such an important topic. So if I could move on to the first slides for me, please. So I'm going to uh, talk initially about some background uh, and some of the work that has been done nationally. And again, we've got some leaders uh, in the field who've been working on this for close to a decade now uh, in the room uh, and tell you a little bit about where some of the national programs that are coming through are and briefly what you need to know. And again, it's something that we may bring up in the discussion later on. My disclosures don't relate to any of this. So we're all here because we're passionate about the outcomes of our patients with rectal cancer and the concept of providing them the best value that we can. So the best outcomes and quality, ideally as efficiently as possible. And there's obviously been a lot of talk over the last few decades now about cure and local recurrence. But there are other things that we're going to highlight later in today's session that are also important. Operative mortality, anastomotic leak, and ways to manage and minimize that, other morbidity, and the concept of functional outcomes. And Dr. Young Faddock will talk later on about functional outcomes. So this hopefully is a soup to nuts of how to manage rectal cancer, focusing on the technical and also with guidelines and direction around some complicated situations. And it is pretty complicated. Um, this is one paper by one of our faculty later on, Dr. Ricciardi, um, who is uh, experienced in publishing on many things and has used the SEER database here just to show us the variability in outcomes of surgeons based on specialty training. And so this is a paper published seven years ago now 19,000 cases, you can see 1,000 counties, half with adequate data. And surprising to many of us who do a lot of this, the abdominal perineal resection rate was greater than 60% in a quarter of those counties. And 40% of surgeons performed only an APR for rectal cancer. So we're going to talk later on, and we've got some super speakers talking about indications for coloanal and techniques for coloanal and intersphincteric. But this shows you that there's a lot of opportunity and also shows you that training and specialty training and an understanding of the disease helps because specialty surgeons were protective against colostomy. In parallel with that kind of data, there's been a large international consensus really about the fact that knowing more about these patients before we bring them to the operating room matters. And we'll hear about that later on. And this is one of uh, Gina Brown and team's papers um, the Mercury study, and without diving into the data here, but really the importance of using high quality imaging with standardized reporting, uh, MRI, to predict your margins, define your margins, and tailor your surgery. And if you can do that with a goal of having an MRI clear circumferential resection margin, uh, your local recurrence rates are a lot lower. You can also use that to standardize your distal margin as well as your radial margins. And you, so you can use high quality imaging to help guide the surgery. And so uh, as we try and standardize how we look after these patients, it helps. Uh, this is a graphic by Eric Roulier, who's not here uh, to talk to us today, uh, but we do have another couple of super European surgeons, uh, Dr. Dapri and uh, Professor Loire from Strasbourg. And we'll hear about different techniques uh, to optimize low anastomosis. And so thinking that in tumors that may have had an APR, um, 
where you could staple, but you can see from the data set in the US, a lot of these patients are probably having an abdominal perineal resection. That not only the, can they be anastomosed, but tumors can be anastomosed with hand-sewn techniques and with partial or complete uh, internal sphincter resections. And then really only a few should need an abdominal perineal resection. And we'll hear about all of the considerations for that. There will be a lot of discussion around the concept of the mesorectum, grade one, where there are large defects or visible to muscle, grade two, where there are smaller defects. And what we're really searching for with each operation that we do is this kind of complete fascial intact capsule around the mesorectum, giving us a nice grade three um, mesorectum. So we're also going to talk a little bit about experience, and obviously the faculty have a lot of experience in this. And so this is a data set put together um, looking at experience of hospitals and surgeons in the US around rectal cancer. And while that's probably a little hard to see at the back from the numbers, the bottom line is that only 30% of hospitals are high volume hospitals. And for this data set, high volume was described as only 20 cases a year. And I think many of us would not think that 20 cases a year for a hospital is high volume. But even with that fairly loose metric, only a third of hospitals are high volume hospitals. So how experienced are the majority of hospitals in the US managing rectal cancer? Probably not very experienced. And that may well lead to a lot of the variability that we see. Because a lot of the surgeries performed by non-specialists, I showed you some of the data about the permanent colostomy rates being variable and often excessive. And I'm going to show you some data now about less than ideal adherence to evidence-based guidelines. And that translates into oncologic outcomes. Obviously, when you look at population data sets, particularly between different countries, um, you know, there are differences in definition and measurement. But the changes in some of these data sets are so significant that there has to be something real behind them. And so if you look at the overall circumferential margin positivity rates in the US versus Europe, National Cancer Database, 17% in the US, Lyon in France, 3 Germany, 3 uh, Dutch data set, 10%, Poland, you can see, and CRO7 in the UK, 10 So just at an administrative data set, we have an opportunity. And this ties into survival. So centralization of rectal cancer. There are now data sets showing that centralization of rectal cancer surgery can improve long-term survival. And I'll show some of that data in a talk later on. And this is a Swedish data set showing group one and group two where they changed to centralized management and survival improved. Interestingly, in some of the Scandinavian countries now, they're now realizing that, hey, we did it for rectal cancer and it worked. We actually have an opportunity for colon cancer. Shockingly, their local recurrence rates for colon cancer were in the um, 10 to 15 percent range. So it behooves us all to think what can we do better. And so David Rothenberger, there have been many people who've thought this thought, but he was one of the pioneers of thinking what can we do nationally to improve the way we do rectal cancer? And the concept of the need for a rectal cancer national accreditation program. And this is a paper published and we're privileged to have Dr. Jim Fleshman here. Uh, and George Chang, indeed, who was part of this, and Steve Wexner, who's been a leader in this, and a number of others that you can see listed uh, on this paper. But the concept of a national rectal cancer accreditation program. Um, and so this is a, a data set, uh, again, looking at the NCDB. And if you move down the slide towards the bottom, you can see that the majority of patients were treated in low volume. And for this definition, that was only one to 10 cases a year, uh, or intermediate volume centers and only a small number were treated in high volume centers. Again, um, we could do better. And the highest adherence to pathways and evidence was best in those high volume centers, which is a consistent trend. Uh, same was found for circumferential margin positivity rates. Uh, it was associated with volume and expertise. So what about quality programs then? So the College of Surgeons has done a lot of work, as you all know, around quality programs, uh, MBSA quip Commission on Cancer, NAPBC, NISQIP. And so there's now been a, a partnership um, of the college and many surgical societies around rectal cancer. This has worked well for bariatrics. It dropped in hospital mortality rates significantly. At the accredited centers, it's a third uh, of what it is at the non-accredited centers. Uh, by the way, to those of you at the back of the room, the mouse is not working for some reason, so I have no pointer here. Um, if you could see if that's possible to fix. 
Um, and so the COC now um, has a commitment to providing comprehensive, high quality, multidisciplinary, patient-centered care. And so they've supported the concept of doing this uh, around rectal cancer. So the NAPRC is something that was started by that group uh, that I mentioned uh, and some others who are, are not in that paper. Uh, Steve Wexner deserves a lot of credit for pushing it through and getting the college on board. Jim Fleshman, I mentioned his name, you see his photograph here, obviously one of the pioneers. Dave Winchester, Dave Hoyt on behalf of the college pushing it through. Guy Aranjo for our society doing a lot of legwork. And then two large groups, the Ostrich team who came up with the standards. Uh, and then a number of groups in different societies who reviewed them, and then the Fundamentals of Rectal Cancer Surgery Committee uh, who helped put the educational program together, which is being currently uploaded uh, to the ASCRS website. So this is the program that was rolled out, and there are standards. I'm going to go through them very quickly, first in the interest of time, and second because they're publicly available. Um, but so the nationally accredited uh, programs for rectal cancer uh, have to be uh, COC accredited hospitals, they have to have a defined rectal cancer multidisciplinary team, including surgery, pathology, radiology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology as a minimum. You have to attend. Surgeons need to attend 50% of the designated conferences. Um, other specialists can have a delegate, but not surgeons. It's got to meet at least twice a month. There are several education modules for participants. Uh, the ASCRS Fundamentals of Rectal Cancer Surgery Program for Surgery, a CAP program led by Mariana Burho for Pathology, and a really nice program that the American College of Radiology have rolled out uh, for radiology. The FRCS program, there's been a huge team involved in this, many people in this room, um, a lot of vice chairs, a lot of work done in the background, a lot of questions written, and content brought together. Um, we went through all of the appropriate steps of developing uh, a high stakes educational curriculum. It is not that now, it's going to be used for MOC. And so the curriculum is now complete, it's being uploaded, and we'll have MOC questions for those who take the test. Other standards, I've just picked a couple of highlights that are important. So standardized staging reporting for MRI, standardized synoptic operative reporting for surgical resection, and there's a trial going on now with a standardized surgical synoptic report that certain sites are, are um, checking out. Standardized pathology reports to look at margins and quality. Photographing the specimens. Photographing is probably important. There are complexities in how you store them, but if you know it's going to be photographed and shown at the, at the uh, conference next week, it'll hopefully push some people to do, do a little bit better. How ready are many places for accreditation? Uh, this is a survey done of ostrich member institutions. Well, you can see that the highest volume centers were more likely to be compliant, but not all centers. Do standards improve outcomes? Because that's really what matters in the end. Well, it looks like they probably do. And this is a super paper, again by Jim Fleshman. When he moved to Baylor in Texas, he looked at pre and post standardization of care. And you can see, um, Persistent distal tumor rates, as an example, pre-MDT, which is dark blue, tapered off to nothing by 2014. Local recurrence rates dropped. Uh, impressively, uh, recurrence dropped. And so there's good data, not surprising, that expertise, training, and standards help us do better. I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time and just mention that if you look at the process measures that we have, probably only about 28% of institutions are following them at the moment. If we look at the performance measures, probably only 56% of institutions are measuring them. So, and again, that's volume related. We have an opportunity. The National Accredited Program for uh, Rectal Cancer is a really good step in the right direction. And um, thank you very much.